Praise the Lord, church. I'm a person of destiny. Grace and mercy follow me. And I know I'm in love. Christ has already overcome your enemy. As a result, when I am in Christ, when I am found in Christ, I walk in victory. And this morning, I'm thankful for that victory today. You may be seated this morning for just a moment. Today's a very special day. It's a day that I always look forward to, and it's Family Sunday. And here's what is so special about this. I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing our children in service with us this morning. And I'm so thankful that they are in service with us. And so I want to say welcome to all of our children today. And I want to say I'm proud of you to all of you parents today. (laughs) Now I remember, let me be nostalgic for just a moment. I remember as a young child being at church 
And we used to do stuff in church, like peel bubble gum off the bottom of the pews, fall asleep under the pews. We played matchbox cars under the pews. We played army and cowboys and Indians under the pews. I mean, we had we brought a spread when we came to church. Oh, and we had snacks. We got to figure something. We got to have snacks on Family Sunday. Anyway, I digress. I'm thankful to have all of our children in here today. And I know parents that sometimes it's difficult when our children are with us in this setting because we want them to be quiet. We want them to not be restless. But there is something very special about our families being together for this service. Number one, they're able to see worship modeled by mom and dad. They're able to see how mom and dad interact with the rest of the body of Christ as they worship. They're able to see how you as mom and dad respond to the preaching of the word. They're able to see how you respond when it's time to pray. You know, I've seen pictures from time to time from the services, and I'll see a whole row of mom and dad and, and their children during worship. And I'll see the children with their hands lifted, worshiping Jesus. And I want you to know that just doesn't happen by accident. When I see prayer time happening and moms and dads have their children with them and they're praying with them, that's important. When mom and dad may not have their hand lifted during a worship moment and all of a sudden you see that child sneak that hand up, it's because they saw it modeled. And so thank you for being a part of today. Thank you for being a part of this service. If you are a guest here today, and you are here for the very first time, we want to extend a welcome to you as well. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of Parkway. Amen. We celebrate you. We are excited each and every time we know that we have a, a new guest here. And I'll just tell you this. We have something we do, and they'll throw this number up on the screen for you, 414-253-8080. And for all of you that are joining online, it's on the screen for you as well. And we always ask that you would text the word welcome. Maybe they're not going to put it on the screen. But I'll tell you what it is, 414-253-8080. And if you text the word welcome to that number, then we're able to get a little bit of information from you. Here's really what it's all about. Two things. Number one, we want to connect with you so you know what's happening here at Parkway. You're made aware of all the various ways that you have to be connected to the body of Christ. Secondly, I get a little report every Monday that's on my desk. And on that report, there's a list of names of every person who filled out that welcome card. And you want to know what I do with that? I pray for you. I pray for you that God would bless your life. I pray for you that you would find a place that you belong that you would know that you're valuable. And so, if for no other reason, we can all use the prayer. So fill out the welcome card and let me see your name on Monday when I come into the office. With that, I want to just say you can use that number for a number of things. You can use that number to give. You can use that number for prayer requests. But we want you to be connected to who we are. This is a great body of believers. It's a great family. We want to be there for you. We want to encourage you. We want to support you in your journey with Christ. So thank you for doing that. And then the very next thing that I would say to you is, uh, I mentioned this to the Dream Team this morning. Uh, we are moving into the Christmas season. We talked about this last week a little bit with Pay It Forward. And I, I would just remind you, our culture has become very self-centered, very me-centric. How refreshing would it be for those of us, with every interaction that we have, we make an intentional connect to somehow serve someone as we go through this season. That we might model Christ to those we come in contact with. What would God do if we became available in that way? So today, as we move through the worship, continue to receive from God today. Allow your heart to be open that you might make a fresh connection with him again today. Would you do that with me? Amen. All right, let's stand together again. I feel like we're a little bit quiet. You might have to rev them up a little bit this morning. I don't know. Let's try this. Is God good? Yeah. All right.
you want to worship this morning? You want to lift up a praise this morning? Okay, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your faithfulness. And today, God, we have gathered in this place for a specific reason. We may not know why we came here. We may think we're here simply because someone invited us. We, we may be here because it's our tradition to be here. But today, Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would have this moment of clarity right now. We have come to lift up praise to you. We have come to touch you and to be touched by you. Have your way in this service. We give it all to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Let's worship.
Your kingdom is here. 
Let's put our hands together and just offer to God the praise He deserves. Hallelujah. We could do this for a long time and it would be appropriate. Amen. I'm very much aware of the fact that we have uh, our youngsters with us today. I think I think that's a, a very special occasion when our family comes together to worship. Hallelujah. Amen. We love our children. And uh, this is considered to be Family Sunday. And, uh, and I believe God has something for everybody that's here today. It doesn't matter how old you are. I know there's a song, uh, I was online listening to some worship even before I came, and, and there was a song that, that we sing frequently, and I heard it this morning, and, I, and even some of the songs that I heard today, some of the, some of the words reflect this idea that God is, is for us. <laughs> God is for us, and it doesn't matter how little you are, and I'm looking at some really tiny children that are here, I want you to know Little boy, little girl, God is for you. <laughs> you, may, you may think you don't matter, but that is, that is not true at all. Amen. God has a plan for your life. And this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about it. I think we might have the, uh, the title up here. Why don't we put the title up right away? Just give everybody a, a chance to know what we're talking about. I haven't seen this yet. Do you see that? What do you see? Dominoes, and there's a hand that's setting them in place. This morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about the God arranged life. The God arranged life. I wonder if you would pray with me, gracious Father. We're we're so thankful, Lord Jesus. We're thankful, Lord, for a place that we can come together and exalt you and worship you, Lord. Where we can, Lord Jesus, hear your word and go forth, because. Lord, it is so powerful. It has such meaning. And Lord, when we, Lord, apply it to our lives, when we apply it to our hearts and our minds, Lord, it has a way of changing everything. And so we pray, Lord, that you'll put your blessing, dear God, upon lips, upon ears, dear Lord, that you'll accomplish your purpose for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. The Bible has such great stories in it. Um, I, I love the stories that we find in Scripture. Um, who doesn't enjoy David killing the Goliath? I mean, that's, I mean, kids just love that, especially boys. They like action. Little boys and big boys like action. And, uh, and uh, I have to confess to you that, uh, that I enjoy a good love story. Am I the only one? You know, I, I just do. I, I, I don't mind telling you that uh, I confess that tears well up in my eyes when I think about uh, Ruth going out into that field and then Boaz coming along and he looks at her and he says, who is she? And all of a sudden you know something is going on, you know. I think about the story of Isaac and Rebecca. Um, wow, you know, she's, she's on a camel and she sees this, this guy and she's thinking in her mind, is he the one? Is he the one? And so I find that, uh, that these are exciting stories and exciting stories for children, for all the children, and especially those that are old enough to notice the opposite sex. Um, I was as I recall, about six at that time. I don't know if that's an early bloomer or a late bloomer, but, but it's, uh, it's also great stories for parents, especially when their kids notice the opposite sex. And so, you know, it's also a great story for everybody else. And the reason I say that is, is uh, there's stories about, about serving and, and serving, basically, another word for that is ministry. 
And so we're going to talk about a story, and it's going to be the story of Isaac and Rebecca. And this is a story about an arranged wedding. And, and let me say this, if you don't already know, uh, the little children here may not understand when we say arranged wedding, we're talking about your parents choosing the person that you are going to marry. And I would think that there might be some kids that just say, oh boy, that's not something that I would want. I know that there are cultures that still do that today. As a matter of fact, we had many years ago a young girl that came from India. She actually came to the University of Wisconsin. She met some of the people from our church. They brought her to the church and she found Jesus Christ. She had been a Hindu. And, uh, and she made this decision for Christ, realizing that her parents intended for her to get an education and come back and marry a Hindu boy of their choosing. And she, she wouldn't do that. She didn't feel she could do that. And so it's my understanding that her family that was well off had cut her off entirely because she wouldn't go along with an arranged marriage. In America, the culture is different. We have, we have kids that are basically, they, they choose for themselves. So I have a question for our young people today that are here, and that is, would you trust your parent to choose your husband or your wife? I will tell you that they're looking out for your interests. I will tell you that they will they'll make the very best choice that they can. There's a Sikh family down the road here. As a matter of fact, I had an opportunity to go and talk with them one time. And as I was having this conversation, it came out that, that his marriage had been arranged with his wife. And I said, now let me understand this. Your parents chose her and you did not know who she was? And he said, no, I didn't. And he, I said, well, how, how did that work out for you? And he said, very good. <laughs> parents, parents think well for their kids. They want what is best for them. But I have a better question than would you trust your parent. The question is this, would you trust God to make that kind of decision for your life? And we have to begin with an understanding, something that's very, very important for all of us to know. And that is that God loves you, and he's for you, and he wants what's best in your life. In fact, his plan for you is only good. It's only good. It's all good. I'm reading from Jeremiah chapter 29 and 11. Many of you are familiar with this. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. This is God speaking. He's speaking to Israel, says the Lord. He said, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future. I want to give you a future. I want to give you a hope. This is a message from God to his people. And, and I will say this, Israel was a type of what was to come. Israel was a type of what we are today, a type of the church, a type of God's family. We are his children. We became his children by new birth when we were born of water and spirit. And God knows you. God really knows you. As a matter of fact, he knows you better than you know yourself. And he wants to arrange for your life. He wants to arrange a, a blessed life. Now, I, I realize that we all think, but you know, I, I really, I trust myself. I think that I could make good decisions for me. I know what I like, and I know what I don't like, and I felt that way growing up. I did. And so as a youngster, as just a teenager, I started to make choices, choices about things that I thought would make me happy. Whatever made me happy, I wanted to do it. And, and all of a sudden, you know, I, I came to the realization that my, my life was going sideways. In other words, I was, I was messing it up big time. And then I realized that I needed to trust God. And so I turned to God, and I'm so glad that I did. You see, see, his thoughts were, were so much better than my thoughts. His ideas for my life were so much better than my ideas for my life. In Isaiah, we read, 
He said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, though your ways my way, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You can trust him. I'm saying you can trust God. You can trust God with your life. You can trust God to make the arrangement for your life. So if if it's marriage, let God make some choice in your life. I believe that God directed me. I believe God had his hand. And here's something that worked out very well. If, it, if it's your friends, let God get involved in choosing your friends. If it's what you do, or it's where you go, let God be involved. Much of the time, we make good choices. They're not always bad choices. But there are times when we don't. There are times when we do things or make decisions that, that bring regret or, or sorrow or misery. And, and they should have been avoided. And we can take the risk out entirely. We can take the risk out of every decision. By trusting God to arrange our life. Let God arrange your life. And I will tell you that your life will be wonderfully blessed. Youngster, let God arrange your life. And many times he's going to use your parents who are praying for you to be able to help with every decision that's being made. And we see this in the story that unfolds to us in Genesis chapter 24. And I'll, I'll let you turn there. You can look on a different version. We're taking a very easy version to understand the New Living Translation. And so we begin in that 24th chapter of Genesis where Abraham, by the way, is he's old. He's 140 now, and he's blessed with great wealth. And the promise of, of a nation by his wife Sarah is on his mind because Sarah had died now, and Isaac was the only child he had by Sarah. And so Sarah needed, excuse me, Isaac, her son needed a wife for the family to grow as God had promised Abraham that it would be like the sand of the sea. It would be like the stars of the heaven. And so it's just a matter of now finding the right person. Picking that chapter up in the second verse, one day Abraham said to the man in charge of his household, who was his oldest servant, he said, swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not let my son marry one of those local Canaanite women. Go instead to my homeland, to my relatives, and find a wife there for my son. Now, not all mar marriages were arranged back then, but this one was going to be. Abraham knew something very important, and that is you've got to have the right wife. He knew that. And so the qualifications were that it would be somebody, a girl that would trust in God. Now the Canaanites, in that time, they were given to, well, they're given to idolatry. And with that came terrible conduct, vile things that they did. And they were a people that were cursed by God and they were going to be doomed to destruction. I'm sure that God had dealt with Abraham about this. He said, he can't have, Isaac can't have one of those girls. And so we find that, that he comes to the place where he draws his servant to him, the Eliezer is his name, and, uh, and tells him, I want you to go and get a wife for my son. Of course, he's a little uncertain about his success. And so he says, maybe we should involve your son in that choice. Picking that up at verse 5, and the servant asks, But suppose I can't find a young woman who would travel so far from home. May I then take Isaac there to live among your relatives? No, Abraham says. He realizes this is the land of promise. Be careful never to make my son there. He's for the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and my native land solemnly promised to give this land to my offspring. And he will send his angel. And this is so beautiful. He's going to send. God's going to send an angel ahead of you. And he will see to it that you find a young woman there to be my son's wife. There it is. There it is. What we all need. And that is divine help. 
<laughs> God gives help to the servant. It's coming. You see, that's because God was involved in the quest. And our decisions that we make every day that don't necessarily, in need, necessarily in need to involve God. We don't have to ask God, what should I eat today? What shirt should I put on? What shoes should I wear? But when it comes to life choices, God wants us to be involve him. And God wants us to be willing to allow him to arrange our life. Parents need to do exactly what Abraham did. And that is they need to pray about who their children marry. Mm -hmm. We did. We did. And I will tell you that God really did bless our family. There's no question about it. Abraham wanted a wife for Isaac who would be willing to put her trust in God. And, and our willingness, that matters to God. Your willingness means everything to him. God doesn't make anybody serve him. God gives us choices. And he wants us to choose him. He wants us to choose the, the decisions that he makes for our life. And he blesses those who are willing. And so we read verse 8. And she was, if she is unwilling to come back, this is the servant now speaking. He said, then you are free or I should say Abraham speaking, he said, if she's unwilling, you are free from this hope. But under no circumstances are you to take my son there. So the servant took a solemn oath, solemn oath that he would follow Abraham's instruction. He loaded ten of Abraham's camels with gifts and set out, taking with him the best of everything, the best of everything the master owned. He traveled to, to Aram Naharim, and went to the village where Abraham's brother Nahor had settled. And as for, Ab for uh, uh, Eleazar, he, he, just, he just trusted that God had the task at hand. He just trusted that God knew exactly what he would need to do. And, and so he showed himself to be faithful. Servants, Matt, the, the people that are in ministry, they need to go to God and they need to ask, God, help me with this. Direct me and then be willing to do it. It's not just a matter of planning the work, but it's working the plan. Yeah. It's what it is. And, and so we find this plan involved quite a bit. There was a caravan, a caravan of 10 camels. And they would carry helpers and they would carry supplies and they would carry treasures. And they would travel some 500 miles. The journey would take pretty close to two months for them to get there. Eliezer, he, he makes this journey and finally he gets to the place he's going to. He arrives to the place that Abraham had come from. The place where he would find that wife for Isaac. Verse 11 says, he says there was a serv Then the, there the servant made the camels kneel down beside the well just outside the village. It was evening, and the women were coming out to draw water. They were coming because that was what they did, the young ladies. This was their domestic duty. It was no easy task with these ladies coming for Eliezer to, to make the right choice. How many times we think that we know what to do? And so what do we do? We just jump right into it. All right, we go to it. I know what to do. But Eliezer humbled himself to ask God for his providence. Ask God for his help. And so he prays. He says, oh Lord, God my master, he prayed. Give me success and show me kindness to my master, Abraham. Help me to accomplish the purpose of my journey. Notice there's a lot of prayer involved. Let me say this. If you want God to arrange your life, okay, there needs to be a lot of prayer involved. I'm going to say that again. If you want God to help you, if you want God to direct you, if you want God to be with you, I want you to know, prayer will make all the difference. Abraham, he prayed about the mission. But we find now Eleazar, he's praying about the method. Verse 13, he says, See, here I am, standing beside the spring, which was a well, and the young women in the village are coming out to draw water. This is my request. I will ask one of them for a drink. If she says yes... Certainly, and I will water your camels too. 
Let her be the one that you appointed as Isaac's wife. By this I will know that you have shown kindness, kindness to my master. God, I think, is already involved. I really think the test that, that Eliezer came up with something that God had planted in his mind. What a perfect test it would be. And so while he's still praying, a young woman named Rebecca arrived with a water jug on her shoulder. Her father was Bethuel and was the son of Abraham's brother Nahor and his wife Milcah. Now, now Rebecca was, was very beautiful and she was a virgin. She had left, slept, no one had slept with her. And she went down to the spring, filled her jug, and came up again. Running over to her, the servant said, please give me a drink. I will tell you this, this prayer that he's praying before he even said amen, she arrived. You know, many times we're thinking if we pray, it's going to be a long time before God responds. Sometimes God just says, just ask. And while you're asking, I'll start doing the work. In fact, many times we may not see the results, but the work starts the moment that we ask. So Eliezer runs up to her and he says, can I have a drink? And he doesn't know that she is already the right person. He's already of, the, of Abraham's family, the granddaughter of Abraham's brother. And, and if you want to figure this out, this is basically the daughter of Isaac's cousin, the daughter. And you might take that it's a generation away. Unfortunately, it's, I mean, it's not at all. Because Abraham didn't have Isaac until he was 100. So that would put her at about Isaac's age. And so he asked for water and she immediately replies. No hesitation on her part. She says, certainly, sir. She said, and when she quickly lowered the jug for him to drink, when he had finished, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they had enough. So she quickly emptied the jug into the watering tray and ran down to the well again. She kept carrying water to the camels until they had finished drinking. Now the Bible talks about her beauty. I think it's wonderful to know that that she was beautiful, but there's just so much more to her than her looks. I mean, how, how do we get over her kindness? How do we get past her hospitality? How do we get behind her willingness to do what would consider to be very hard work to do? I mean, you know, looks can deceive us. We know that. As a matter of fact, Solomon had written that in the Proverbs. He said, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. That's something that won't fool anybody. Solomon knew something about them because there were women that turned his heart from God. So Rebecca, she, she offers to water the camels, ten of them. I wonder if anybody has any idea what that means. Have you ever heard the expression they drink like a camel? There's a reason for that. A camel can drink 53 gallons of water in three minutes. 53 gallons. <laughs> I did a little calculation to find out what water weighed. I want you to know that three gallons of water weighs about 25 pounds. If each camel drank, and, and it, it basically she, she actually continued to bring water until their thirst was satisfied. I don't know how much that was. But had it only been six gallons, I'm sure it was more. Had it only been six, she would have made 20 trips from the well, and she would have hauled over 500 pounds of water. I mean, the task, the task had to take hours for her to do it. And here Eleazar is watching, and he's watching in silence, contemplating, is this the one? And when she was finished, he then did something for her. Verse 22, then at last, when the camels had finished drinking, he gave her a gold ring for her nose and two large bracelets for her wrists. Now, I want to point out to you that back then, that was currency. They didn't have coins or paper money. I mean, they, they had the currency of jewelry. It was a medium of exchange. 
And so scholars talk a little bit about, you know, how much that would have weighed. And it would have weighed, all of that jewelry would have weighed about, about two and one quarter ounces. By day, today's standards, the value of gold, she would have received about $4,000 for her job. That's not bad payment. For what it's worth, I want you to point out to you that she was never told that she would get anything. She had no idea who this man was. Kindness like Rebecca's gets God's favor. It's something for every one of us to remember. But Eliezer needs to know more about her. He said, whose daughter are you? He asks. Would your father have any room to put us up for the night? My father is Bethuel. She replied, my grandparents are Nahor and Milcah. Yes, we have plenty of straw and food for the Campbells and have room for guests. So she announces that, of course, that she would be willing to take them in. And she tells him that she is basically a relative of Abraham. I mean, Eliezer, he falls on the ground immediately. And he begins just worshiping God because he knew he was led by God. I wonder if we really know when we're being led by God. Sometimes we wonder but when we start seeing the results from letting God direct our life, it's appropriate for us to worship. So many of us come and just lift our hands because we know what God has already done for our life and what God is doing. So Rebecca runs home and she tells her family about what had happened. And guess what her brother notices about her? Hello, Kaching. I mean, that was certain to get his attention. Now Rebecca had a brother named Laban and when he saw the nose ring and the bracelets in his sister's wrist and when he had heard the story he rushed to the spring where the man was still standing beside the camels. Laban said to him come and stay with us. You who are blessed by the Lord. I find it so significant not just the very fact that he saw an opportunity but he realized God's blessing upon that man's life, upon Eleazar. If I, it was so significant that Laban would call him the blessed of Yahweh, the God that would become the God of Israel, the God of Shem who had moved to that particular area. The blessing was obvious, the blessing that Eleazar had, had with him, and the knowledge of God was still retained by the family. Everything was just right because God was arranging it. Hospitality was an important part of their culture. And seeing the favor the traveler had showed to his sister, it just made the quest all the, all the easier. Um, they wanted him to come and stay with them. Eliezer, he came to the house, and before he ate, he told this whole story. He told about Abraham wanting a wife for his son a wife from his family, and how he had traveled some 500 miles to where Rebekah came to a well. And she answered the prayer, so to speak. She was the answer to the prayer that, that, that Eliezer had given to God. And, and so when all of this is revealed, then the servant says, he said, so tell me, Will you or won't you show true kindness to my master? When you tell me, I'll know what my next step should be, whether to move this way or that. Having heard the story with the answer of, of his prayer, where Rebecca comes and offers the water of the camels, we find Laban and Bethuel. This is her father replied, the Lord has obviously brought you here. So what can we say? Here is Rebecca. Take her and go. Yes, let her be the wife of your master's son. And as the Lord has directed. And the servant now, he bows to the ground. And again, he worships God. And then it becomes Christmas for everybody. In those days, it was a custom for a father of the groom to give presents to the bride's family. So there was silver and there was gold. There was clothing for Rebecca and gifts for the parents and even for the brother. And the next morning, Eliezer, he wants to go. I mean, he's been gone for some two months, and he wants to leave, but 
the parents recognize that they are sending their daughter. This isn't easy for parents. They're sending the daughter that they had raised. Sending her away. Probably to never see her again. So they said, we don't want to keep her just for a few days. Eliezer doesn't want to stay long, so he agrees. That Ten days would be fine. And then they realized that they didn't consider, consider Rebecca's feelings at all. We can exasperate children. There's no question about it when we make all of our decisions for them. And I, and I think when it comes to their safety and I think when it comes to their protection, parents do need to make decisions, especially when the children are small. As they get older, though, I, we need to involve them in the decision making. I, I think it's so important that we need to talk to our children. I'm going to say that again. We need to talk to our children. This idea of just do what I say, that, that's poor parenting. And so if you want your children to do something, or if you want them to go someplace, or if you have some direction for their lives, I think you have to give some explanation as to why it is that you're doing this. And I will tell you, it'll be much appreciated. Else you'll drive your kids away from you. So in verse 57, we find, well, they said, we'll call Rebecca and ask her what she thinks. So they call Rebecca. Are you willing to go with this man, they asked her. And she replied, yes. I will go. There's no question in my mind that she realized God was doing something. She wanted God to arrange her life. Do you want God to arrange your life? Do you want God to help with the decisions that you make, the life decisions that you make? Willing to go to a strange land. I mean, this, was not a, this is not an easy thing for her to do. Willing to, to leave her family, maybe never see them again. Willing to, to marry somebody that you never met. Trusting that God was arranging it all. And so she leaves. And she leaves with something extremely important. Now it's time for the parents to give her something. And what they gave her was something that every parent needs to give their children. And that is the blessing, to give them the blessing. They blessed her with this blessing as she parted. Our sister, maybe you become the mother of many millions. May your descendants overcome all their enemies. Then Rebecca and her servants mounted the camels and left with Abraham's servant. The nurse accompanied her along with other attendants. I want to go back now to Isaac. Let's go all the way back to that land where Eliezer was sent from. And I want to point out from this point on, and this is very important, Abraham, of course, had been instructing his servant. But from this point on, we don't hear much about Abraham at all. The reason I say that, I think it's very important that Abraham lived for another 35 years. He lived to be 175, but the plan that God had for Israel, for Messiah to come. That plan would be taken up by the next generation. There, there's a time when parents, and there's a time when leaders, they just need to let go and let the next generation step up and take their place. Abraham had done a great job and, and including the preparation of his son for this time. And we can see this by the activity of Isaac when he was at home waiting. Verse 62, meanwhile, Isaac went home when he was in the Gev, had returned from Berlaheroil. One evening as he was taking a walk in the fields, meditating, he looked up and he saw the camels coming. It's no small thing that Isaac was in quiet contemplation, spending time alone with God in the evening when all of a sudden, how appropriate, he looks up and he sees the fulfillment of the promise to his father coming. When Isaac looked up and he saw Rebecca. Rebecca, excuse me, looked up 
and she saw Isaac. She quickly dismounted. Who is this man walking through the fields to meet us? The servant replied, it is my master. So Rebecca covered her face with her veil. Then the servant told Isaac the whole story. Uh, the beauty of this scene, it just, it just cannot be overstated. She sees somebody walking through the field, heart pounding. Could, be this, could this be the one? Is, it, is this the one? I'm sure the servant had told her on the trip. I mean, that was a long trip. Everything that she needed to know about Isaac, the kind of person that he was, the God-fearing man. I would call this, if, if there is such a thing, a hallmark moment. It, it, it's more of a, it's just a God moment. It's just the way that God does things. It's the way that God arranges things. All, all of the emotions, uh, the elation, the excitement, the joy, all of this just coming to this, this crescendo. And that's just the way that God does things. That's a part of the way that God arranges things. It's like the excitement of receiving the Holy Spirit. But the anticipation of it, when it happens, oh, there, there's nothing like it in the entire world. The presentation of Abraham, by the way, the presentation to Abraham as a daughter-in-law, we don't even know, we don't know anything about it. Nothing is said about that. But we read this. This is the conclusion of that story. And Isaac brought Rebekah to his mother's tent, and she became his wife. He loved her very much. And she was a special comfort to him after the death of his mother. This is a, this is a description of a, of a primeval, you know, uh, marriage, you know, reaching back to the realms of, of innocence. It's pure, it's holy, but there's just something so important about those words. But he loved her, he loved her very much. I will tell you that if we allow God to order our life, I can promise you that it's going to be something that you will love. Let's just clap our hands to the Lord. Even though Isaac and Rebecca grew up miles apart, God brought them together. God had a plan. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for every life that's here. This story is filled with similarities about how God works in our lives and he works daily in our lives. We have to decide, though. Our decision is this. It's just really simple, and that is, are we willing, are we willing, are we willing to allow God to range our life? Let's stand together. It's our choice. As I look around the, this audience, I realize there are youngsters that you have an entire life where God can be directing your life. And then I'm looking at people that are parents. God has a plan for you and as it relates to your children and, and you will continue to guide them. I talked about things being passed on to generations, but that older generation continues to coach and continues to, to be that constant source of, of help and support and encouragement. And so God's going to be continuing to order and arrange for your life. And then there are those that just serve in ministry like a faithful servant, committed to the task, but making sure they're getting God involved in it. We should be asking, every one of us should be asking the question, God, what do you want from my life now? I still ask that question. In one way or another, I ask that question every day because I begin my day by asking, God, what would you have me do today? Where would you have me to go? Who would you have me to talk to? How can I advance your kingdom? God, help me to see the doors that you're opening. And some think they know, you know, because they go through their, their thinking, they know what's going to make them happy. 
And so therefore, the many times they're thinking, well, I don't know if I want God involved because I'm not sure that, that, that God's plan is going to give me what I really want. Let me say this. God's plan and your happiness are not exclusive. They're not separate. God's blessing for you is going to bring you peace and it's going to bring you joy. It's going to bring you that happiness. I think we're all familiar with that verse. Probably most people have committed it to memory. In Romans 8 and 28, where it says that we know all things. Everybody say all things. All things. Work together for good to those who love God. To those who are the called according to his purpose. <laughs> Everything's going to work out all right. God wants to give every one of us a future and a hope. Father, we are grateful again. Thank you for stories, dear Lord Jesus, that speak to our heart. Can it be any clearer? to us, Lord Jesus, that you love us and you have a plan, a plan for good, a plan for peace, a plan for happiness, a plan for joy, a plan that will give us contentment and satisfaction, a plan, Lord Jesus, that will leave us fulfilled. What could be better? And having the one who loves us the most and knows us, knows our hearts, dear Lord Jesus, to direct our path. Let us always be mindful, Lord Jesus. You have your eye on us. <laughs> There's a life that you want us to bring to you, Lord Jesus, with willingness, dear God. We want you to have your way, Lord. We sang earlier, your kingdom come, Lord. Hallelujah. That means we want you to reign, Lord Jesus, in our lives. Help us, Lord, with every decision that we make. We want to glorify you by saying yes. Yes, Lord, whatever you ask and whatever you say. Let your will, Lord, be done. And let it begin with us. Let it begin with my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know that there are some limitations on the prayer that we can have as a result of the disease that we're all dealing with. And I, I pray, Lord, that, uh, that you would be able to communicate with God in, in, in a special way, right? there's any reluctance on your part at all whatsoever to do something that God is dealing with you about, make up your mind. I want God to arrange my life. I want him to arrange every step. Every decision, I want him involved in it. I want his angels to go before me. I want them to help me. And that's a great prayer for you to pray at this time. Let's have some private time with the Lord. You can kneel at your pew. You can sit. And there's certainly room for some to come here, but I'd ask you to keep your distance. Hallelujah. I give you my life. I give you my trust. She Jesus.